So 2019 was a great year in terms of new uh, guidance and consensus guidance on management of type 2 diabetes. If we look at the previous guidelines, they recommended uh, getting patients to goal, keeping them at goal, and following A1Cs and adding on therapy as needed to get people to goal. Um, but if you look at the previous guidelines, it was all all of the therapies looked almost on even plane. And what we've what we've come to appreciate with a lot of randomized control trials, long term studies, short term studies, is that not all drugs um, have similar effect for all patients. So what we've seen for the first time with the 2019 guidance is true patient-centered guidelines, putting the patient at the center of the consideration of the choices of therapy. The big changes that we saw in the 2019 guidance are number one, um, evaluating whether or not a patient has a history of cardiovascular disease. Because we now know from the randomized controlled trials that if someone has cardiovascular disease, certain therapies may have benefit compared to the other standards of care therapies. So that's the first big change, is establishing whether or not a patient has a history of uh, cardiovascular disease or cardiovascular risk. Um, and in those patients, one would consider either a GLP-1 receptor agonist or an SGLT2 inhibitor. And there are nuances in terms of when one might consider each of those. The second big change that we saw in the 2019 guidance is earlier uh, consideration of GLP receptor agonists. Uh, specifically, if someone is um, being considered for injectable therapy, GLP-1 receptor agonists should be considered even prior to insulin, unless there's clear indication for insulin, such as very high A1C, A1C above 11%, or uh, symptoms of severe insulin deficiency, like catabolic symptoms, weight loss, polyuria, polydipsia. Uh, in this year, we've seen a recognition based on the randomized control trial evidence that GLP-1 receptor agonists have a comparable or even greater efficacy than even insulin without the weight gain and without the associated hypoglycemia. So they've moved up um, when considering an injectable therapy. So that's the, um, those are the two big changes that I would say stand out with the 2019 guidance. In October of 2018, the American Diabetes Association and the European Association for the Study of Diabetes um, came together and developed a, a new version of the recommendations around management of hyperglycemia in type 2 diabetes. So the major focus is is exactly that. This is what to do to manage high blood sugars um, uh, in diabetes. And the things that are fundamentally new this time um, are a greater emphasis on weight management um, and lifestyle therapy in general. You know, we've always said that that was foundational in diabetes, but now we point out that there's even more data that p patients can have clinically meaningful weight loss with lifestyle management. And if that's not enough, we have new medications that are effective. And if that's not enough, bariatric surgery certainly plays a role. So that's a greater emphasis based on the fact that we know that it can work. We have more and more evidence in that regard. The second is a greater emphasis on so-called patient-centered shared decision-making. And that's the idea that in a chronic disease like diabetes, if we tell a patient what to do, there's a 10% chance they'll do it. Um, I think all of us recognize in our lives that you know, when our parents tried to tell us what to do, when our bosses tried to tell us what to do, when anybody tries to tell us what to do in any realm, uh, it's, you know, it's hit and miss whether we actually do it uh, in the long run. But if you engage in shared decision making, the patient is really participating in the process. I do think patients are generally adherent. They do what they agree to do when they participate in that decision. And then the third and probably the biggest change um, is an emphasis on what to do in patients with clinical cardiovascular disease. So we say that's the first question you should ask a patient, you know, once you get past, uh, you know, tell me a bit about your life and why are you here today. It's absolutely essential that we understand whether patients have clinical cardiovascular disease or chronic kidney disease. And if they do, these two new classes of drugs, the SGLT2 inhibitors and the GLP-1 receptor agonists have proven benefit for reducing events, heart attacks, stroke, um, 
bypass surgeries, interventions, um, heart failure hospitalizations, the progression of chronic kidney disease. I mean, really powerful, um, important endpoints. And then the, uh, the fourth thing that's, uh, that's new and probably the most controversial bit um, in the report um, is the notion that if a patient needs the additional power of an injectable medication, that they should actually turn to the GLP-1 receptor agonist first instead of insulin. Now it's very important that patients and providers understand whether they have type 1 or type 2 diabetes. In type 1 diabetes, insulin is life-saving. It's absolutely essential. So a patient with very high blood sugar who's losing weight and very symptomatic, you should think about whether they might have type 1 diabetes even if they're 70 or 80 years old. Um, so that thought has to go through your mind before you pull the trigger on prescribing a GLP-1 receptor agonist. But we recommended that class of drugs as the first injectable because they're at least as powerful with regards to A1C lowering and improving blood sugar control uh, as insulin, um, but they do so with weight loss instead of weight gain and with no risk of hypoglycemia as opposed to a real risk of hypoglycemia uh, with insulin. So those are the top line recommendations from the American Diabetes Association now in 2019. So how close do providers and clinicians adhere to the guidelines? I would say that the guidelines are fairly impactful, but with any guidelines, it takes time to see the actual uptake and incorporation and to see a change in practice. So I think that is, it's, it's both an asset and a barrier. Uh, the nice thing is the American Diabetes Association updates its standards of care every single year. So every January, you see an assimilation and incorporation of the recent evidence and a really well thought out um, guidance in terms of how clinical care standards might evolve and change. But it does take time to see it incorporated into day-to-day -day practice. And we've seen plenty of publications on that front whereby it could take um, a good five to 10 years before things become part of the day-to-day. The ADA guidelines, along with the ACE guidelines, are sort of a roadmap to help think about how you approach therapy in patients with type 2 diabetes. I think the ADA, the American Diabetes Association guidelines, are pretty well accepted. I think people understand the reasons behind it, and I do think most endocrinologists and primary care providers try to follow it. However, if we look at the real world, a lot of times we fall short of meeting those goals. Now, I'll tell you, I firmly believe a lot of that's cost. I think for a long time, these agents were thought to be way too expensive. You know, 10 years ago, oh, nobody's covering it. Well, if you look in 2019, almost every commercial plan covers a GLP-1 receptor agonist or an SGLT-2 inhibitor. Almost every Medicare Part D plan covers one of those two classes of agents. So that old argument that cost drives everything is, is really not as true today as it used to be. Still, we do have some patients that cost is the number one agent, which is why we still see things like sulfonylureas, you know, and agents that are a lot less expensive, but that don't provide the kind of benefit that we know these other classes do.